Reproducibility is important in science for so many reasons. One of the reasons that I think is totally undersold is the ability to reproduce our work across projects. What do I mean by this? Well, stay tuned for the rest of today's Code Club and I'll show you what I mean. Hey folks, I'm Pat Schloss. Reproducibility can mean many things to many people. On one end, if we take the same code or the same methods and apply it to the same system, we should get the same result, right? That's a basic idea of reproducibility. Another approach to reproducibility that I'm really fond of is the ability to take the same code and apply it to different systems to not get the same result, but to get the same process, the same processing of the data, the same visualization of the data, the same analysis of the data across those different data sets. To me, that's a win. Uh, that really improves our ability to replicate our analyses and do the same type of analyses in multiple different settings. Also, uh, it is the basis of the name of this channel, uh, which is Riffamonis. The idea of Riffamonis uh, comes from the idea of riffing, uh, where we might take a theme, uh, say in music, uh, and replicate it across different settings with slight different perturbations. If you're a fan of Hamilton, the musical, uh, perhaps you're familiar with the counting sequence from one to 10. That counting sequence is used maybe three or four times across the musical, each time with a subtle change. Uh, and that if you think about it in kind of the context, it tells a different story each time it's used. Well, I'm not making Hamilton here. I'm sorry, I'm not Lin-Manuel, uh, but I can make my life easier by taking the analysis I apply for one project and using it into another. Obviously, I think this also says a lot about how we can learn to program uh, and that I can learn to program by taking a code chunk that somebody else has developed. I can adapt it to my use and then modify it to, to make it better or to you know highlight the unique aspects of what I'm doing. That is how I learned how to program and that is how I try to teach people to learn how to program themselves. So if you've been following along with recent episodes of Code Club, you know that we've been building an ordination using different packages, different approaches uh, to a data set that was developed by a former graduate student in my lab who's now uh, Dr. Alex Schubert. Um, we've taken that, we've improved it, we made it look nicer. And what I'd like to do now is see if we can take that same coding approach and apply it to another data set that was made by another former student in my lab, uh, Dr. Neil Baxter. The ordination we've been working with looks at the variation in the gut microbiota of people without diarrhea, those with diarrhea, and those with diarrhea and who are also positive for Clostridioides difficile. The new data set I wanna work with from Neil Baxter's papers looks at the variation in the gut microbiota of people with normal colons, those with adenomas in their colons, and those with carcinomas in their colons. My goal for today's episode is to take what we've done for the Schubert data and modify it for the Baxter data. Looking in my raw data directory, you'll see that I have the same files for the Baxter data set that I had for the Schubert data set. Also, I have schubertadonis.r and schubertnmds.r. I'm gonna start by renaming these to be Baxter adonis.r and Baxter nmds.r. And I will go ahead and open this up in our studio. And if I go ahead and open up these scripts, one thing that I see right off the bat is that I'm sourcing in Baxter nmds.r Schubert adonis.r. So let's go ahead and change that to Baxter adonis.r. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, source the whole thing. Great, so this created Schubert nmds.tiff. Um, that is the visual that we expected to see. It didn't fail on anything when we ran the Adonis um, R script. Uh, you might recall that we had a stop if not in there if any of the comparisons were not significant. So that looks good. So if we start in Baxter Adonis.R, I'm gonna go ahead and change Schubert to Baxter throughout. Um, I think there's only a couple places where I used Schubert. I guess I can go ahead and do a search on Schubert and I think I got them all, okay. Something that occurs to me is that not only are the file names different, but the column names in my metadata file are probably gonna be different than what I had in Schubert. And certainly the, the diagnosis or the treatment groups are gonna be called different things between the two different data sets. So I'm gonna to wanna to update this in adonis.r as well as in nmds.r. Let me start by running these first uh, 11 lines of code and I can then look at metadata to see what the columns are called. Uh, let me make this a little bit bigger so you can see. Um, and the column I'm gonna want is this DX column, which is short for diagnosis. And the other thing is that I've got sample here. 
and sample um, instead of sample ID. So that's good. And um, again, wherever I have sample ID, I'm going to go ahead and find that. And I'm going to replace it with uh, sample. And so I can replace all those. Uh, it's a little bit dangerous to do find all, replace all, but when we'll run it, it'll let us know if we screwed something up. And kind of scrolling down through here as well, I see disease stat. That's what we had before, and we want to replace that with DX. So if I do disease stat, um, I can then replace that with DX, and I'll replace all of those, and there's 10 of those. Um, kind of scrolling down through here, uh, we get down into the different uh, diagnosis groups. And we're going to have normal, adenoma, and cancer. And so I guess wherever I have case, I'm going to call that cancer. So I'll replace all those. And then uh, wherever I have non-diarrheal control, I'll put normal. And then wherever I have diarrheal control, I'll put adenoma. Uh, it's kind of the same stepwise progression. So I found those four. Let's go ahead and run all this and see, see what happens, see if anything blows up. So that went through well. Let me look at meta distance. Again, what we're gonna see in meta distance is that we've got our metadata uh, and then we've got our different um, patient IDs, sample IDs. I can then run all distance. So I have an error here that it can't subset the columns that don't exist. Those columns do exist. I think the problem though, is that when I read in the distances, it read in those columns, um, the, the column of sample IDs as a double. And so again, if I look at um, the default, it read in as double. And if I look at distance, um, I see that this first column, which is my sample ID, is a double. Um, I'll go ahead and modify this. So I'll add call type, types, uh, calls, and I will do, um, so that first one is x1 is going to be call character, uh, and that needs to be a function. And then I'll do dot default equals call double, and that should work. And so now if I look at distance, oh, distance, not distances, um, I see that my first column is of type call character. And now if I run these, uh, so I'm getting an error that it can't join these two data frames because sample in metadata is of type double and in, in, in the distance matrix is now of type character. So those need to be the same. Um, Read Excel doesn't have the same interface for defining column types. So what I'm gonna do instead is to do a mutate I'm going to mutate uh, sample to be as dot character um, on sample, and that so then that should make metadata uh, that first column now should be of type character, which it is, and we can now do the inner join and life is good. So again, as we're using different data sets, we know that we have different structures to the data, and so it does take a little bit of hand holding of the data to get it to where we need it to be. Um, and so now if we do all distance, that works. No error messages, that's good. All test is running. And if we then look at all test, and here I'll make this window a little bit bigger so we can see it, um, is that we do have a significant p-value, um, 0.01. And so now we are okay uh, to proceed on to the next step. And again, if we look at all p, we should get all p, um, our p value. Um, we now can also look at our different diagnosis groups and the counts there. I don't really know why I have that line there. I'll go ahead and remove that. I need to define my pairwise p. And now what I'm doing is um, uh, renaming things. So this shouldn't be cancer diarrhea, it should be cancer adenoma. Uh, and what we're doing here is we're filtering the data frame to get those rows. Someone emailed me to ask if we need to make sure for Adonis that our rows in our distance matrix, rows and columns in our distance matrix are the same as in the metadata. Yes, absolutely we do. And so in this step, we are doing that. 
And that's why we did the join of the metadata and the distance matrix so that we have everything in the correct order. And then we're refiltering things and then pulling things right back out of, apart again. So I need to go ahead and change that diarrhea to adenoma um, here as well. And we are sampling that out. And this again will be adenoma. So I'll update these. Run that. And then this again will be adenoma. And that should be good. And so now if we will look at pairwise P, we see that it's 0 0.05. So it's probably not going to be significant when we correct for multiple comparisons. All right, so uh, we have cancer health. I'm gonna go ahead and change health to be normal. Uh, a fun discussion <laughs> item for a lab meeting or water journal club might be, what's the difference between healthy and normal? Are they the same thing? Hmm. No, they're not. All right, uh, so we'll run that. And then we look at cancer normal test and then pairwise P, cancer normal. And so here we now see that uh, the P value for cancer adenoma uh, it's 0 0.05, cancer normal, it's 0 0.01. And now we wanna look at these. And I'm gonna go ahead and change diarrhea to adenoma. Hopefully this doesn't screw all sorts of things up. I think we should be okay. And run the test. And now we look at pairwise P and we see that adenoma to normal is not significant. Cancer to adenoma is 0 0.05. Cancer to normal is 0 0.01. And we can then recall that we did this P adjust on all of the values of pairwise P, run that. And we see that sure enough, cancer to normal is significantly different, but cancer to adenoma is not significant. And so this will yell at us, right? It will stop. So I'm going to now modify this to be a, um, I'll, I'll create a variable called um, significant, and I'll do that uh, p adjust less than 0 0.05, and I will then do um, so. Significant will then be uh, false, true, false, and I'll do a stop if not. Um, let's see. Uh, let's do stop if not cancer normal, uh, or it should be significant, and then square brace quote significant normal that. So that's good. And then stop if not significant uh, cancer adenoma. And it'll also then be um, adenoma normal. And I'm going to do not significant, not significant. I'm I'll slap a ampersand in the middle there because what not significant cancer adenoma will give me is true and not significant adenoma normal will give me is true. And so then both of those with the and will be true if they're both true. Okay. And so then we can do stop if not, and now we're good. So what this analysis has told us is that the uh, difference between cancer and normal is significantly different, but otherwise, Normal adenoma aren't different. Normal adenoma um, and adenoma and cancer are also not different. So we'll go ahead and save that. And let's go ahead and return to Baxter uh, NMDS.R. And I will run that script just so we know that it all works. What we're seeing as we work through that um, Baxter Adonis.R script is again, as we use different data, perhaps different metadata configurations, we need to update for different columns, column names, data types, uh, values in those columns, right? So we don't have um, non-diarrheal control, diarrheal control in case. We now have normal adenoma and cancer. And so we have to update that um, and, and that, that works well. Um, all right, so now we're ready to come in and start working on our plot. And so again, wherever I have Schubert in here, I'm gonna replace that with Baxter. So I'll replace all of those. And uh, 
again, this will allow us to read all this in. Um, something that I'm going to do because I know I had to do it earlier is the call types. And uh, this will be calls group um, equals call character. And then otherwise the default will be call double. Okay. And then metadata, again, I'm going to do a mutate. Let me put in some more white space here. There's no need for it all be jammed together. A mutate a sample, and that will be um, uh, as character on sample. Okay. And then, um, so that's good. And then our inner join will be sample on group. And then we need to mutate um, dx, and that's going to be a factor dx. And our levels will be normal adenoma and cancer. And again, what this levels is doing is putting things in the right order uh, for the pr for the disease progression. So that way, um, if we were to if we were to say plot things in a um, an order, we'd want it to be in the order of the disease progression. I actually don't know that we really need that for um, this visual, but you never know. So now we come to my legend. This was a chunk of code that created labels for each of the different clouds of points in the ordination. I'm going to comment this out for now. I'm not sure that I want to incorporate that. I might leave that for you to play with later on. Um, this geom rich text interacted with that as well. So we need to set the color disease stat to be dx. Uh, something else that occurs to me is that instead of copying and replacing, finding and replacing disease stat and changing it to dx, up ahead, I could have renamed my dx column to be disease stat. Um, that, that perhaps could have made life a little bit easier as we went along here. So this all looks pretty good. Um, I'm going to leave the titles where they are for now. Um, I am going to change my breaks to be normal adenoma and cancer. And I'm going to use, uh, I'll stick with gray, blue, red, and I'll put normal adenoma and carcinoma. All right. And so then I'll use these same um, breaks down here. Uh, this is the fill that I'm fill manual that I'm modifying here. And I liked the lighter colors to give it kind of a more muted background color for those ellipses. And I think for the most part, this looks pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead now and um, run my ggplot line, as well as saving the visual. And so this gives me this ordination diagram. Um, healthy individuals have a different microbiota from those with diarrhea. So this is normal diarrhea cancer. Um, and what we saw was that the cancer was significantly different from healthy and diarrhea. Um, I'm not totally seeing it here, <laughs> but hey, you never know. Um, perhaps the red is shifted over a little bit. Again, remember that the ordination is a visualization of the distance matrix, and it, it removes a lot of information um, that is in the distance matrix. And so I would believe analysis on a distance matrix, such as what's done with Adonis, over what was done um, in this visual using the ordination. And we can say um, individuals with normal colons. And maybe I'll do put the individuals with outside of all that. Normal colons um, have a similar microbiota as those with adenomas. But um, those with Uh, carcinomas uh, but 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 different from those with carcinomas okay so if we run that what do we get we see individuals with normal colons have a similar microbiota to those with adenomas but different from those with carcinomas so I've got to kind of um, play with the, the spacing a little bit um, so I'll put it between similar microbiota, 
similar as those with adenomas. Um, so need to remove that. So again, you've probably seen me futz with this stuff before. Uh, it's a little bit tedious, but is the difference between making things look good and making things just look kind of half-assed, if you will. Um, and So adenomas, um, let's put it after the but, but different from those with carcinomas. And so I'll put the carcinomas back up a line. So individuals with normal colons have a similar microbiota as those with adenomas, but different from those with carcinomas. Cool. Um, and then I'll say, I need to update my caption down here below. Uh, so I said all pairwise comparisons were significantly different using Adonis. So that's not true. I will say uh, the pairwise comparison between um, normal and between people with normal colons and those with uh, carcinomas were significantly different using ben blah, blah, blah. Um, but other comparisons were not. Okay, and so again, if we run this, great. So we have um, our caption is updated. I, I went ahead and just put in the line breaks where I needed them. It took a little bit of experimentation, but uh, you kind of get the idea. Um, again, I hope this gives you a sense of what we can do to modify our code from one application to a new application. Some things to think about as we do this, however. I've got the same color scheme for this Baxter data as I did for the Schubert data, right? So things are gonna start looking derivative. We kind of see that when people start using uh, common packages. So for example, I can look at a plot made by someone using ggplot and know that it's made by ggplot because perhaps people didn't change the default color scheme or the default way the axes look. Uh, they're just these telltale signs. And so if you see the same color scheme propagated throughout uh, a group's figures or across a you know, bunch of papers, then we can kind of see that you know, this is derivative. Um, something else to think about is that as we went through, you know, there were different things we could do to perhaps make it easier to generalize, easier to reproduce across data sets, right? So we talked about, you know, we could, we could standardize that that first column is the sample ID and that it's call character. We could also change the column we're interested in to have it always having the same name. So we had disease stat and DX, perhaps we could standardize that. Um, and as you do that, then perhaps within a group, group, it's useful to share your code. And if you do a lot of that, then um, it becomes useful to turn those into functions. And then from there into a package that, that then becomes more useful to other people. And also then becomes ultimately more reproducible because um, you're not kind of futzing with the code as you work through it like, like I did a lot in today's episode. So that's actually happened. <laughs> so the vegan package actually has a fair amount of data visualization and analysis baked into it. If you do that though, if you follow the vegan approach, then you're, you're stuck for better or worse with the design decisions that the developers of vegan have implemented, right? Just like if you use ggplot, you're stuck with the defaults that Hadley Wickham gives you because he was the primary developer of ggplot. Those are good decisions in some places and other places you might say, you know, I, I really don't like that. Um, I don't like his gray backgrounds and grid lines that he has as the default color scheme, right? Um, so anyway, know that there's trade-offs and pluses and minus, minuses in whatever you end up doing. So what I've done in today's episode isn't that far removed from what I've been asking you to do with these episodes. I'd love it, absolutely love it, if you took the code that we've been working on in these episodes and applied it to your own data set to see if you can customize the code for your own purposes. A few episodes back, somebody commented on that in the episode saying that they got it to work for their data. And that just made me feel so good, right? So if I can reproduce it for my own uh, data sets, for other data sets from my lab, and you can do it, then I think we're really winning. And again, we see the value of reproducibility. Something else to note about this Baxter data set, uh, we are gonna go back and work more with that Schubert data set, but the Baxter data set is the data set that I use all throughout a tutorial series that I have called Minimal R that's available at the rifamonas.org website. I think it's rifamonas.org slash minimal R. I also use that data set as the basis of a set of three-day workshops that I teach. Would love to have you 
uh, participate in the next one if you're interested. So please, please, please take this code that we've been working on, apply it to your own data. Something else I hope that this emphasizes is the value of posting your code online to make it openly available for others to use. If you're getting benefit out of the code I'm giving you, just think about the benefit that other people will get out of seeing your code. Again, a fundamental part of reproducibility is that we should be able to take the same code, apply to the same data, and get the same result. But that, that's only so far. That, that gets us only so far with reproducibility. The true value of reproducibility in my mind is that you could take my code that I've generated with this to generate this plot and apply it to your data to get a new plot and that you can then modify it to do something further. If anything, I hope this also shows you the value of making your code publicly accessible. You're hopefully getting value out of the code I'm sharing with you and walking through with you. Just imagine how much value people will get out of seeing the code that you're using to do your analysis. I can't tell you how good it feels that somebody has dug through my code for papers we've written and we've posted the code and they've gone on to use that code in their analysis and they write me to tell me about it. That's just, that's just a win, right? I feel like that is the true impact of focusing on reproducibility in science. Anyway, keep practicing with these concepts. Please spread the word and tell your friends about Code Club. I really appreciate the time you spend uh, sitting with me and working through this data and working through these different types of visualizations. We'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.